My friends, it is such a pleasure for us to welcome you to the Lady Lake Seventh-day Adventist Church. You are about to experience one of our worship services that we have every Saturday morning, starting at 11 o'clock and ending at 12 noon. Our address is 231 Lake Griffin Road, Lady Lake, Florida, 32159. We're very excited. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 9 and verse 37 and 38, Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. We certainly invite you along with the Lady Lake Seventh-day Adventist Church congregation to be that laborer, to answer the prayer that Jesus asked us to pray. We ask that you will be blessed as we now go into our church service. Thank you so much for being here with us. Often in a reverent time we say amen And when our hearts are joyful, hallelujahs ring again In old camp meetings on the grass are temples built by men A saint shouts hallelujah and we all join in From the first hallelujah to the last amen I'll praise the Lord and then I'll praise Him again, sharing the love of Jesus with all men. From the first hallelujah to the last amen. We say hallelujah, that means praise the Lord. And amen simply tells us that our hearts are in accord. So if you feel restricted, strike a brand new chord. Let's all agree together now to praise the Lord. From the first hallelujah to the last amen. I'll praise the Lord and then I'll praise Him again. Sharing the love of Jesus with all men. From the first hallelujah. to say amen and don't you ever hesitate to join right in if you can't praise the savior now you'll be embarrassed then when we sing hallelujah and the angels say amen from the first I'll praise the Lord and then I'll praise Him again, sharing the love of Jesus with all men. From the first hallelujah to the last amen. From the first hallelujah to the last amen. Amen. I can say, I'm going to say that backwards. Wow. Boy, doesn't, doesn't praising the Lord like that just get your blood a-bubbling? I mean, I, I saw y'all's faces out there and your, your eyebrows are moving, but you didn't know if you could move your leg or your feet, but uh, it's okay. Praise the Lord. Thank you so much. Just want to again welcome each one of you here to the Lady Lake Seventh-day Adventist Church. I wonder if there's someone here for the very first 
time. Is there anybody here for the very first time? I was told by my, our presiding elder that I needed to find who those individuals were and have them talk to me. My friend, yes, please stand. Tell us your name and where you're from. Oh, okay. Now, which one was your wife? The one on this side. Okay. She sings the, the lower notes, doesn't she? Oh, man, I was trying to pick out voices. Praise the Lord. Does she sing you to sleep? <laughs> well, we're going to have to talk to her about that. Welcome to the Lady Lake Seventh-day Adventist Church. Anyone else that is here for the very first time and is willing to admit it? Okay, now, now who do you belong to? Oh, you belong together. Well, what is your... We, we already know your names. Now, well, how about the pianist? Do we know the, the pianist that was playing today? We do. Of course you do. <clears throat> yes, and Miss Marianne, it is so good to see you again. Yes. Anyone else that is willing to admit that they are here for the first time? Well, we just want to praise the Lord that every last one of you are here. And I'll tell you, my, my knees are still skipping from that music. Thank you so much. It's now time for us to pray together. And before we pray, I just want to say watching Jack's face and watching Lamar's face while those ladies were singing leads me to believe that we may not be able to duplicate what they do because none of us sing that high, but I think we can do a trio here very easily. Just watching the two of your, your faces during that. I strongly suspect that if we saw all the difference, even the tiniest of our prayers make, and all the people those little prayers were destined to affect, and all the consequences of those effects down through the centuries, we would be so paralyzed with awe at the power of prayer that we would be unable to get up off our knees for the rest of our lives. There is power in prayer. At this time, we are going to be praying for, with, on behalf of each other. So instead of our prayer time being me corporately praying for all of us, we're going to do things just a tad different this morning. I want you to look at the person next to you, and uh, maybe there's three of you that are clustered together, and you are going to pray for each other this morning. So share some concern you have on your heart, and let's minister together to each other other of what is going on in our hearts. So find yourself a prayer partner this morning right next door to you and ask them what you can pray about and pray together and then I will end this season of prayer with a prayer from the front. Father in heaven, Lord, we want to thank you for a church that cares for each other and prays for each other. God, you alone know all of the things that have happened in our lives since the last time we were together. And Father, you alone know how to best solve the quandaries, the situations, the hurts, the regrets that we carry in our hearts. You have promised us, Lord, that you would give us a new heart, that you would put your spirit in us. And this morning, Lord, we want to thank you for being willing to share yourself with us. We've been blessed already this morning, Lord. Your angels have sung to us. Our hearts have responded. We have praised you singing. And you have spoken to us, calling us to worship you. 
this morning as we study together. We ask that your Holy Spirit will be breathed on us in such a manner as we will leave this place closer to you and more full of your power than we came in. Thank you, Lord, for mending us, for mending our families. Thank you, Father, for giving us patience. Thank you for allowing us to express our joy in salvation in this place. We do pray, Father, that you will be with our country. Police officers who are commissioned to protect and to serve are being slain left and right. Father, we ask that you will not withdraw your spirit just yet, but that you will continue to use your spirit to draw our hearts to you. Father, please protect our communities. Protect the leaders in our communities. Father, we turn to you because we have nowhere else to turn in situations like this. Grant us, Lord, your eyes to see things as you see it. Grant us your heart to love people as you love us. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. We have been going through a series on soul winning. Maybe it's providential that this morning my sermon material got to the the bulletin secretary a little late because the sermon title this morning is simply, I Quit. (laughs) Maybe it's better that that sermon title not be in the bulletin. Uh, Maybe I should have called the conference office and or emailed my three bosses above me and let them know that I was preaching a sermon today entitled, I Quit. So what am I quitting? That's the question, isn't it? Um, If my superiors get uh, voicemail from the precious members of this church, I will praise the Lord for that because it will mean that the message got through. If they do not, I will receive. A, I will praise the Lord for that. If you do not leave a message, I will praise the Lord for that because I will know that you understood what the message was all about. Our first sermon was entitled, in this series, was entitled, Where Are You? And it was focusing on how God Himself comes to the Garden of Eden as a God that seeks humanity. God did not want to let humanity go. And so God plummeted himself into the shape, the form, and the smallness of humanity in order to interact with us. Peter told us the following Sabbath that we are a chosen generation. You are not here by mistake. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You are God's own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. God has a purpose for you, and that is to proclaim the praises of God who called you out of a life of darkness and into a light of life. Then we learn from 2 Kings chapter 13 that when these these men were carrying a dead fella and the... um, these attacking enemies were coming in. Instead of taking the dead guy where he needed to go, they threw him into the tomb of Elisha. And as soon as that dead man hit the bones of dead Elisha, now who was Elisha? He was a prophet. He was one who spoke on behalf of God. As soon as that dead man hit the bones of that dead prophet, he came to life telling us that when we are exposed to the word of God, It brings new life to us. 
Then we looked again at Genesis 3, 9. Where are you? God came to the Garden of Eden and God wanted to communicate with fallen humanity. Jesus desires a relationship with you. He wants it more than you and I want our next breath. God desires man's conversation. You know, I'm reminded of one child as uh, a parent was carrying his child out of the sanctuary. The child yelled to everybody in the sanctuary, you pray for me. (laughs) I think that's what your precious little boy was doing right there. God bless you. You know, it's it's such a privilege to have a church, as David put it when he, Elder, Elder Moss put it when he was up here a moment ago, there's a lot of children singing in this place today. And we, we praise the Lord for our young people, don't we? I was just very much reminded when he, was, when he was going out there. Then you and I looked at 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, just as God sought us in the Garden of Eden, God longs for our hearts to seek after Him. He says, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sin and will heal their land. God desires to communicate with us and He desires us to communicate with Him. God wants us to be honest. God wants us to be real. God wants us to take off the facade of whatever mask we are wearing and simply be raw with Him. Today our sermon title is entitled, I Quit. It is based out of Ephesians, the fourth chapter, in this list of spiritual gifts. Let's pray together, and then we will study. Father, bless us now, we pray, in the name of Jesus. With the gift of your Holy Spirit, inspire us and draw us to you this morning, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. We are going to go to Ephesians chapter 4. So you are in Romans for the scripture reading. Simply turn to the right from the book of Romans. You will go past 1st and 2nd Corinthians and then Galatians and then you will find the book of Ephesians. Ephesians the fourth chapter. You and I are going to begin reading in verse 11. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11, it is on the screen. I just didn't want you to think you brought your phone or your Bible for no reason this morning. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11 says, And he gave some apostles. Who is this he that gave? When you go back up into verse 7, it says, But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Christ gave his all. All of God's grace is then given to us. Then you go down to verse 11, and he, this is God himself, and he gave some. These are gifts that God is giving to individuals. These are not gifts that God is giving to the administrative people in the church, although they do have gifts as well. This is God speaking to the membership of the church. I'm a member of Lady Lake, so this is God speaking to me not as a pastor. This is God speaking to me as a member of this congregation. It's not that I carry a particular title other than a child of God, and all of us carry this same particular title. Here it says in this list of spiritual gifts, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists. These are gifts that God is giving. And some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Now, how many individuals do you see underlined there? You, one sees one because of the sentence structure, dear teacher, probably. And some see how many? Two. Now you see a total of five. We've got apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Ding! You're the ultimate. You got the quintessential right answer right there, young man. The part that is underlined. Well, let's go backwards. He gave some apostles. That's a group of people. That's that's uh, given to this group that God designates as apostles. And some he gave 
prophets, the gift of prophecy. And some evangelists, the gift of being able to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And some pastors and teachers. In the original language, the sentence structure that is used here, this structure of this phrase in Greek suggests that Paul intends to speak of two phrases of one office. Two phrases, two phases of one office. So the pastor is also supposed to be the what? The teacher. Now you and I are going to understand that this word that is translated pastor is used 17 times in the New Testament and only one time is it translated pastor. Every other time it is translated as shepherd. Only one time do we have a verse in the New Testament that says that God gives some pastors and teachers the ability to shepherd and to teach. That then means that the persons, not singular, but the persons, because remember, this list is given to the membership of the church. It's not given to just the administrative aspects of the church, although they do have gifts that God has given to them. God here is speaking to us. If, if the cameras would allow for one moment, God is speaking to us. We are a group of people to whom God has given particular gifts. It's not that God just simply gave gifts to one or two people. God has given gifts to every one of us. It has been said that in the world of Christendom, you are either a missionary or you are a mission field. Well, this morning I'm going to tell you at the end of this service what I'm quitting. On the screen, you see this pastor-teacher thing that is played out. You have this pastoral aspect on the right-hand side, and you have this teaching aspect on the left-hand side. You will also notice that there are different colors. Uh, Dr. Clayton Charles tells me I need to use different colors when I'm presenting because it keeps people's attention better. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Charles. So here's the color. But there's some color coordination that is going on here, for those of you that like to match. The words or the, the references that are in the same color use the exact same word in the original language. So we are going to look at these. We are going to look at the pastoral aspect and we are going to look at the teaching aspect that God has given to his membership. Not simply to those that occupy a place up front. God has given these gifts to Every one of us. Now before we look up here, we're going back to our scripture reading. Let's go to our scripture reading. And we're going to go to Romans 10 and verse 13. Romans chapter 10 and verse 13. You know, I told uh, Elder Moss when he was up here that I was going to tickle his feet. He said, go ahead and tickle it. I'm not ticklish. I'm glad he didn't say he was going to tickle my feet or I would have laughed before he even moved his hand. The Bible says here, and you'll notice why I mentioned feet when we get to verse 15. In Romans chapter 10 and verse 13, it says, For whosoever, Romans 10, 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be, what's the word? Paul here, this highly intellectual author, this very deep spiritual thinker, this guy that used to be a Pharisee, followed the letter of the law, this fellow says right here, very simply put, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be what? Then he says, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed. So if you and I put uh, call, let, let's put saved right here, and we will put call right here. So he says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call, what does it say there in verse 
um, 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not what? Believed. So we're going to put believed right here. And then it says, and how shall they believe in him of whom they have not what? Heard. So we're going to put heard right here. Let's go for the quiz time. What's all the way over here? Saved. What's right here? Call. What's right here? Believed. And what's right here? Heard. Y'all are good. Continuing on here. And how shall they hear without a what? Preacher. We need what? Because preachers will share the gospel and people will what? Hear. And when people hear about the awesome love of God, this agape love that transcends our sin, that sin that transcends our purposeful iniquity, this love changes hearts. It said here in the preacher is going to preach, they're going to share the word of God, and people are going to hear, and those that hear are going to what? Believe, and those that believe are going to do what? Call, and when they call on the name of the Lord, they will be saved. I quit. (laughs) Being the only one, and I don't believe I'm the only one, But my friends, you and I need to understand that our purpose for existing after we accept Jesus into our hearts is to share Jesus with everybody we see. Because when you and I preach, that word is kerusos. It simply means to declare good news. It means to publish glad tidings. Every one of us accepting Jesus into our hearts becomes this preacher that helps people get all the way. So here's this preaching. I mean, there are steps. Nobody's going to deny that there are steps. Here's this individual sharing Jesus. And all the way down there is where that person calls on the name of the Lord and is what? Where does that process begin? It begins over here. It begins with you and I simply opening up and making ourselves vulnerable even at work. Oh, easy for you to say, Pastor Scott, because you're a pastor. It is not my job to share Jesus with other people. I tell Elder Mike Colley and Elder Tim Nichols, I seriously can't believe that you guys continue to pay me for what I do because I was doing what you're paying me for before you ever started paying me. I was doing this for free because I love Jesus. Now, why were we talking about feet? Look at verse 15. And how shall they preach? So you've got this preacher here. That's us. How shall they preach except they be what? Sent. God sends us. We cannot depend That my paycheck is going to get me into enough places to convert the city of Lady Lake to the gospel of Jesus Christ. It won't do it. Neither will your paycheck. When something interesting and a little off balance happens in someone's life at the church, how many people know about it? Almost everybody. The Adventist hotline. The Christian prayer chain. I just need you to pray for this individual. Well, why? Because... My friends, can we not take the energy that we use on that chat line and use it to share Jesus with everyone we know? How beautiful, how shall they be preached except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet. And Elder Moss has his foot up there for us. How beautiful are the feet of those that do what? Preach the gospel of peace. That Preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. God has asked us to simply be his feet. 
to go someplace, to be like Jesus, so that individuals can... He, oh, what's, what's, so the individual, the person with the feet, gets sent. The person that is sent preaches. The person that preaches, preaches to people so that they can what? Believe. Here, thank you. And, well, I was in the wrong place. Here's here. Everybody said believe because believe was behind the pulpit last time. Okay. We are, we're not picture-oriented people. Not at all. Hear. And then when they hear, they will what? And then when they believe, they will... And then when they call in the name of the Lord, they will be saved. All of these steps start with somebody having pretty feet. Happy feet. Some of you probably saw that. I didn't see it. In John chapter 21 and verse 16... Jesus is talking to Peter, and Jesus says to Peter, Do you love me? Jesus here three times. Peter denies Jesus three times. And now Jesus is here talking to Peter, and three times he asks Peter, Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And I know there's a difference in all in the, the, the different words that are used for love there, but what I want you to notice is what Jesus tells him. Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? He's like, Of course I love you, Lord. There's no doubt I love you. Then Jesus says, feed my sheep. Earlier he said, feed my, and maybe this is the time that he said, feed my lambs. Some of you have turned there to say sheep or lambs there. Sheep. Earlier he says, don't just feed my, my, my older ones. Feed my babies. Care for them. Paul, in Acts chapter 20, Verse 28 and 29. Let's go to this one. Paul, Acts, Paul in Acts chapter 20. We're going to go to Acts chapter 20. And we're going to see first. We're turning here because we're going to see first who is he talking to. So we're going to read verse 17. Verse 17 gives us this context of who Paul is addressing in Acts chapter 20. When we get down to 28 and 29. So in Acts chapter 20, verse 17... It says, Acts 20, verse 17, And from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. So who is Paul going to address here? He's going to address the elders of the church. By the way, the work of a deacon in the New Testament, the work of an elder in the New Testament, and the work of a bishop in the New Testament, they all have the exact same job description. Every last one of them do the exact same thing. Don't forget for a moment that, de that the, the Stephen, by the way, Acts chapter 6 where the seven deacons were chosen doesn't even contain the word diakonos, which is the word for deacon. It's not even in Acts chapter 6. We've given that title to those men. Don't forget that Stephen, who was just like we are, a lay member of the church, someone who is not employed by the church organization, Stephen preaches a sermon and is killed because of the sermon that he is preaching. How many of us would do that? How many of us? Here in Acts chapter 20, Paul is going to be addressing the elders of the church in Ephesus. Go down to verse 28 and 29. It says here, Take heed therefore unto yourselves. We are in Acts 20 verse 28. And to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. To feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Who is to be ministering to who in this passage? The church membership is to be ministering to the church membership. You realize that none of these elders were paid? None of them got a paycheck from the church. And they were ministering to each other. So much so that Paul would say, into your hands, God has committed the oversight of this church. In verse 29, he tells them why he wants them to feed the flock. He says, for I know this, that after my departing, that grievous wolves enter, shall enter in among you, not sparing the flock. 
We're still on this pastoral side of this. What does God expect us to do? In John 21, we, God expects us, as the members of this congregation, to take care of each other, to feed each other, to visit each other in the hospital, to take communion to each other in their homes when the shut-in can't make it to church. God expects us to be His feet that take the gospel so that people can call in the name of the Lord and be saved. That's what this pastoral aspect of being a member of God's people is all about. Paul here in Acts 20, 28 and 29, talking to the elders of the church, says it is the job of the elders. And some of you are saying, hey, I'm not an elder. I was never nominated. (laughs) My friends, when you gave your life to Jesus... He anointed you with the Spirit of God for the purpose of sharing Himself with other people. Jesus called every one of us to be the mouthpiece, the hands, the feet, the eyes, the voice, the breath of God. Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. So keep going to the right in your Bibles. You're going to go past the T section, past Hebrews, and then you will be 1 Peter chapter 5. We're going to start in verse 1. Now here is is Peter talking. Now Peter uh, is understood by many, even though the New Testament says that James was the leader of the New Testament church. He was like the, the general president of the New Testament church. Even though that is pointed out in the book of Acts, many people believe that Peter was the the, uh, quintessential person in the New Testament that the church was organized under, of course, after Jesus Christ. Watch what Peter does. Peter levels the playing, and I'm sorry about this, Mr. Bob, or or, uh, everybody that's in that room. He levels the playing field when it comes to ministry. Watch what he says here in verse 1. 1 Peter 5, 1. He says, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder. When he says, I also am an elder, Peter is literally saying, I am a co-elder. I am working with you elders as a peer, as an equal among you as members of the church. I am also an elder, a co-elder, a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Verse 2, feed the flock of God which is among you. Do you see a theme going on here? I wish every time somebody went to the hospital, I could be there. I wish every time that somebody lost a loved one that I could be there. I wish that every time one of our children sneezes that I could take the Kleenex over. But I can't. I quit. I can't do it all. Some people come into the Lady Lake Seventh Avenue Church and and rightly so they say to me, you have the friendliest church in the world. These people in here are incredible. And then I have other members of the church that say, why doesn't somebody care about me? And I'm like, God, why? Every one of us are called to minister to each other in this church. Someone goes to the hospital, there isn't a doubt in my mind that Lamar and Colleen have already been there. There's not a doubt. You want to know who's in the hospital? Call Lamar and Colleen. They know. God needs us to be the pastoral leadership. So we've got to get to a different part. Let's go to the teaching. Let's go to the teaching. Go to 1 Timothy. You're real close. So turn to the left. Turn to the left. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 
2. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2. You're turning to the left. You get to the T section. The T section is in alphabetical order. Thessalonians, Timothy, Titus. So no matter where you are, just do the alphabetical thing from the dictionary and you'll be able to find 1 Timothy chapter 3. And let's begin reading in verse 1. Watch what happens. Paul here speaking to Timothy. He says, This is a true saying, 1 Timothy 3, 1. If a man desires the office of a bishop... He desires a good work. Now remember, bishop, elder, and deacon all have the exact same work in the New Testament. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, and apt to what? Teach. Now wait a minute. I thought the bishop, the overseer of the church, was just somebody that, that was preaching. No, no, no. The Bible says that that somebody also needs to be able to teach. Turn with me to Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. There are numerous passages that, that I wanted to go to this morning. We, well, I just chose these. Acts chapter 13 and verse 1. Acts chapter 13, verse 1, we are on the teaching aspect. We know already that every one of us should be shepherding the flock, feeding the flock. Somebody's hurting, we hurt with them. Somebody's sick, we visit them. Somebody is in their house, we go see them. They can't get out and go grocery shopping, we take them grocery shopping. We are to be the arms, the feet, and the legs of Jesus. I do believe that somebody who can't get out of their house and go get groceries can pray to the Lord Jesus, and the Lord Jesus will invent this car, tell the angel to transform his or itself, and then whoop, take this person to get groceries. I believe that can happen. Yet that is not typically how God works. God calls upon the hearts of us to minister to each other. Here we are in Acts chapter 13. Now there was a day, verse 1, there was a day, there were, were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers. They had prophets and teachers? And then it names them as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Menaean, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. Here you have this church in Antioch that has teachers and prophets in it? Somebody called me the other day and said, you know, Pastor Scott, I, uh, I had this, this weird dream. What do you think of this dream? The last dream that I had that was this vivid came true, Pastor Scott. What do you think about this dream here? Interesting, isn't it? Doesn't the Bible say that at the end of time that your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams? That's the Word of God. So you're really wanting to know what the dream was, but I'm not telling you. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 7, Paul is listing another uh, set of spiritual gifts, some of which overlap, Ephesians chapter 4. And in Romans chapter 12 and verse 7, in this list of spiritual gifts, let's start in verse 5. Oh man, the whole thing's good. We'll have to start in 5 though. So we, Romans chapter 12, 12 verse 5. So we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. Whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of our faith. Or ministry, let us wait on our ministering. Or he that teacheth, on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness, let love be without dissimulation, abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good, be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another, not slothful in business, it just keeps going Part of the gift set that God gives to His church is teaching. It's not just the paid ministry that teaches. So why do I quit? In every one of the instances that we have looked at, we have seen that the lay member 
is the one who is the pastor and the teacher. So what then is the role of the paid ministry in the Seventh-day Adventist church? You have all heard this before. Give a man a fish and you feed him for a what? A day. Teach a man to fish and you feed him for a what? Every one of you get excited when somebody comes up here and dedicates their life to Jesus or they get into the baptistry and their old life is washed away and they resurrect to a new life. We all get excited about that, don't we? In your mind, ask God how many people have gone through that process because of your influence. We all get excited when this happens. The one who is the most excited is the one that was actually the feet, the voice of Jesus to those people. You get where I'm getting at here, right? We experience the greatest joy when God uses us. We look up to heaven and we say, Really, God? Because of me, who is a sinner? Teaching others how to fish is the role of the paid minister. We can, we can nibble on that one fish. Or we can bring a whole school of fish into the church. What was the role of the paid ministry at the beginning of the Seventh-day Adventist church? When the Seventh-day Adventist church began, the, there were no paid ministers whatsoever. None. As the church began to grow... Those who were in the administrative aspect who were not paid said, you know, we need to start paying the people that are the church planters so that they can focus on planting more churches. And so a church planter would go into an area that had no church in it. And they would begin to give Bible studies. They would hold tent meetings. They would get out the books of Daniel and Revelation and explain them. And people would flock to it. I know we don't live in the days where you pop up a tent and all of a sudden people show up. Or else every car dealership would do it every day of the week, right? So th this is what happened when the Adventist church began. Is that They would throw these tents up. They would talk about the books of Daniel and the book of Revelation. And then they would give Bible studies and people would be converted to, the, to what the Word of God says. And then they would become Seventh-day Adventists. And then a church would be established in that area. And it was the job of the paid church planter, the only paid person in the Adventist organization, it was their job to train the lay members in that new church, how to do ministry. And then that church planter went somewhere else while that church functioned. Did you know that James White, who was head of, he was the general conference president, he was the editor of the Review and Herald, was also a lay pastor in Michigan? All these other responsibilities he had, and he was a lay pastor. I said at camp meeting this past year that I was jealous of the people who were in the congregation because you guys have opportunity to share the gospel much more than I have opportunity to share the gospel. When somebody asks me what I do for a living, at this point I have two options and one of them would be a lie. I have to tell them that I'm a pastor because that's how I make my living. More often than not, I say, well, my wife has a chicken farm. And then they start talking to me about chickens. And before the conversation is over, they find out that I pastor a church. And they say, well, what church is that? And they say, so where is it located? How do I get there? You guys have such privilege that I as a pastor do not have. I don't know why people are scared of pastors. This is from the seventh volume of the testimonies. You, you guys know that I rarely ever quote Ellen White in my sermons. I bathe my sermons with the writings, with what God gave to her in her books. I'm going to quote several things right now. 
Let the minister devote more of his time to educating than to preaching. Let him teach the people how to give others the knowledge they have received. It is not the Lord's purpose that ministers should be left to do the greatest part of the work, sowing the seeds of truth. In laboring where there are already some in the faith, the minister should at first seek not so much to convert unbelievers as to train the church member for acceptable cooperation. God has not given his ministers the work of setting churches right. No sooner is this work done, apparently, than it has to be done over again. Church members that are thus looked after are labored and labored for become religious weaklings. If nine-tenths of the effort that has been put forth for those who know the truth had been put forth for those who have never heard the truth, after, well, that didn't make sense, who have never heard the truth, how much greater would have been the advancement made? The church is a training center where the people of God are equipped for their respective areas of ministry and mission. Nurture indeed, comes as a byproduct of being equipped and involved in ministry. My experience in Christian education is that a mission mentality in the church motivates people to training and produces astounding results in personal growth as well as church growth. That's from Pastor's Church Growth Handbook. Sometimes ministers do too much work. They seek to embrace the whole work in their arms. It absorbs and dwarfs them, yet they continue to grasp it all. They seem to think that they are alone in the work and the cause of God, while the members of the church stand idle. This is not God's order at all. The greatest help that can be given to our people is to teach them to work for God and to depend on Him, not the ministers. Those who would be overcomers must be drawn out of themselves and the only thing which will accomplish this great work is to become intensely interested in the salvation of others. Jesus told Peter to feed his sheep. Peter taught people how to fish. We too, every fourth Sabbath of the month here at the Lady Lake Seventh-day Adventist Church are going to be trained. Uh, since, Since... As the person who's been chosen to lead this congregation and gets to take care of the preaching schedule, I have chosen every fourth Sabbath of the month to be a training Sabbath. We are going to learn how to share Jesus. We're going to be given tools so that when we leave this place, we can take that hammer, we can take that chisel, and we can pound away very gently at the crust that humanity has put on the outside so that Jesus... Can go in. We will be the holy priesthood that Jesus called us to be. We will be the ones seeing, who see individuals giving their hearts to Christ and becoming inseparable from Him. This morning, your pastor, Scott Moore, quits. I quit hovering over our church and begin to train us all. I quit getting to have the pleasure of all the soul winning fun. I quit. It's not fair. It's like having two ice creams and you, eat, you watch me eat both of them. You would say, that's not very nice. My friends, God is ready for us to fulfill the role that he has called us to. Every one of us get to experience this joy. All of us get to, expe- get to lick a different ice cream cone. <laughs> not sharing, right? My wife said, amen. Can, can I have some of your ice cream cone, Melanie? Oh, no. You've got your own. My promise is that now, why is all of this happening? Because Florida Conference said, Scott, we want you to take a class. We want you to take a master's class from Andrews. And Russell Burrell, who is the retired North American Division Institute of Evangelism uh, leader, came down to Orlando and taught this class. And in this class... He said, I don't think we need to get rid of the paid ministers, but they really need to be doing what God has called them to do. And that is to train the church to do ministry. It was in the 1920s. A.G. Daniels is no longer the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventist president. Ellen White has died in 19... Is it 16? 15. 
Five years she's been gone, then the 1920s began. A.G. Daniels and um, Ellen G. White were against having settled pastors over churches. When A.G. Daniels moves out of that position of leadership, they begin to put paid ministers into positions over local congregations rather than just paying the church planter. When that happened, let's suppose that a church was winning 100 souls a year. When that church got a paid pastor to govern that church, soul winning went down from 100 souls a year to 33 souls a year. That's a reduction of two-thirds of the soul winning that was going on. Because there was only one man doing it now, because he's paid to do it. After studying all of this, I decided that even if somebody called the conference, I was going to quit. I was going to quit being the one. And, and I realize that there are people in this church that work. I'm not trying to be egotistical or anything, but it is time for all of us to, and you'll, you'll forgive the expression, we got to man up. we got a Christian up. we got a Jesus up. We've got to be who God has called us to be. Soul winners. It is my promise to fulfill the role that Christ gave me to train us for service. Those of you that wish that you could come to Lay Institute for Evangelism for that four-month period, you're going to get it one week out of every month. And we're going to have the excitement in this church that we felt every time the life class came in. People are going to be saying, hey, what needs to be done around here? What can I do? Who needs to be, who's, who, who can I go on a Bible study with? Who, who can I share my testimony with? The lady at Walmart, you got it. That's what we're, that's the goal. We will be able to share our testimony to give a Bible study. We will be trained to share Jesus. So we get to make a decision. The fourth Sabbath of every month, you will indicate to me by whether you are here or not whether you want to participate in this training. It is going to be a training session. It's not going to be a sermon. And I know somebody's going to say to me, hey, Sabbath mornings are for sermon time. Inspire me. I guarantee you the life students were inspired when they were trained. Inspiration will be there. The Spirit of God will speak to us and we will leave this place with a new hammer and a new chisel and we will not have bruises all around our fingers. We'll be hitting the chisel where it needs to be hit. Is it your desire this morning to say to Jesus, I'm willing to let my pastor do what he was called to do. If that's the case, would you please raise your hand? Second question. Is it your desire to win a soul for Jesus before 2017? If that's your desire, raise your hand. Okay, we're, we're going to begin this process. And by the grace of God, we are going to see lives transformed inside the church because we are reaching out to other people. And outside the church, because that's who Jesus came to seek and to save. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, I'm fired up. I'm excited about what you are doing in this place. I'm excited about the ministries that are going on already. I'm excited about the grief recovery group excited about Sabbath school classes where we minister to each other. Lord, I'm excited about what you have done today. I, I feel as if you have you've taken the reins and, and just let them out so that we could run with you, so that we could ride with you, so that we could race the wind. Bless us, Lord, as we leave this place inspired to be a soul winner. This we pray in your name, Jesus. Amen.
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. May God bless you this week as you live in the peace of Jesus Christ. Friends, again, thank you so much for joining us here at the Lady Lake Seventh-day Adventist Church. Sometimes people ask us, you know, how can I support this ministry? How can I support putting this ministry onto the internet, onto different Roku channels? And so we'd like to answer your question. To the right of your screen on your computers, if you are on llsda.com and you've clicked on the media link, you'll see a donate tab. We encourage you to return God's tithe to Him and then to give God offerings as He has blessed you. Some people say, you know, I'm not comfortable doing that over the internet. How, how would I send money to, to return my tithe via a check and to give God offerings on a check? Well, you can send that to the Lady Lake Seventh-day Adventist Church, P.O. Box 609, Lady Lake, Florida, 32159. Again, thank you so much for serving the Lord Jesus Christ and being faithful to Him as a harvester in His fields that are ripe with harvest. God bless you.